All right. Welcome back to Let's Talk Fortitude. So we're uh, jumping in to adding on to a second episode of, of this testimony that John's given. And the first part of it was from John's birth up until uh, high school and meeting Ev, Evie. Now we're uh, at point of him being in high school, a longtime friend, an introduction to uh, somebody very monumental in John's life a, as we go forward. Welcome in, John. Hey, hey, man, listen, I forgot, man. I, I left out something I got to back up and tell you all about. This is nuts. Uh, and I hope this does. <laughs> so. I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to tell you how, what type of person I was. Now, listen, I don't know that I ever drove a vehicle drunk, drinking beer, alcohol of any kind. I cannot say that about being stoned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not proud of this, but we had driver's ed class, right, in high school. Uh, I don't think, and listen, my mom and dad, or dad and Donna, they played cards and partied with Wilma Coon. We called her Mama Coon. She was the driver's ed teacher. And uh, so it was usually just me and her in the car because at half time, the person who was supposed to be with me didn't go. But I don't, I'll be honest, with you, I don't think I ever drove that driver's ed car one time that I wasn't stoned. Well, we all have thing. We all have the things that he was. And I'm there. not proud of that. We all have the things that he was there when we didn't know he was. He had to be. That's right. So, so, I, so I got to back up a little bit. So I told everybody about you know the different you know what my report card going in. So going from the uh, eighth grade into the ninth grade, I had seven F's. Right. Yep. So the ninth grade, we could have, we could take high school electives in the in the ninth grade, and the the high schools were just, the high school and the junior high was just a block away. It's, it's the same today. It's same. They're the same place. Yep. They've swapped buildings, but they're in the same location. And uh, so I so I'm like, okay. I I want to go. I just wanted to go over to the high school. So I took Spanish, and Miss Black taught the class. And I, I hate it to this day that I, I treated that poor woman the way that I did. Um, and me, there was another, I'm not going, I'm just, I, me and another girl in there, man, we we fought the whole time we were in there. But anyway, the, so I had, I had Spanish and then my lunch period was the very next bell. It was the very next period. So I would just leave my Spanish class and go have lunch with the high schoolers. And then when the bell rang to go back, I just walked back over to the school. That's right. And I kept cologne in my locker because every day I was getting stoned at lunch. So, and this went on, bro. This was in the ninth grade. Okay. <clears throat> and this went on. And, and yep. I, I want to clarify something too. The marijuana that we smoked back then, is no what was nowhere near the THC levels is what they smoke today. I mean, I just it's just not. Um, I've done, I've never smoked it now, but I, that's what I'm told. But uh, that's one of the things I could never touch again, or it would be bad for me. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so I meet Ev, right, and I'm mm -hmm. still getting stoned at lunch, and uh, so we started dating. And, and uh, I got to tell that story real quick. So here I am out. First time I ever get my get get to take the car out by myself, get my license, and I'm supposed to go see another girl. And Phil's with me. We're just gonna go visit. She's babysitting. Come to find out, I couldn't find the place where she was at. Couldn't find the house. So a girl by the name of Tyra White was having a party at her house. I told Phil, I said, "Man, let's go up to Tyra's party. You know, we're just driving around. You know, we think we're big time out by ourselves, right?" And Abby well, and Phil are broke up at this time. Okay. They're not dating. So we get up there and Evie's there. So long story short, that's the first time we ever went out. 
and he was with me and I left him there to party, took Ev out. We went out riding around, talk, whatever. And then, uh, but anyway, long story short, uh, 43, 44 year late, 40, 44, 43 years later, here we are. And that's it. So, yeah, but I'm going to tell you something, man. Um, God knew what he was doing when he took me to Foster, West Virginia and Foster Hollow. Because though I was still doing some things that I shouldn't be doing, um, he brought the right people into my life at the right at the right time. They're my they they didn't put up with drinking, they didn't put up with doping and smoking. The kids didn't do it. They were hard working, uh, blue collar family that farmed and had animals and cattle and, and gardens. Uh, their dad worked in the coal mine like a dog. And I mean, it was, they, they were just some very hard, great West Virginia people. And <clears throat> they, they were, they were raised church of Christ, old school church of Christ. And uh, so through that, you know, Evan and I started dating and, and I came out, our lunch periods were different. And, uh, I think it was my sophomore year. No, it would have been my junior year, her sophomore year, because she's a year behind me. So anyway, I went out and got high at lunch. And when we'd been dating about a year or so, and when she saw that I, that I was high, she looked at me and she said, this is it. I'm done with you. And I said, what? She said, I'm not doing this. She said, if you ever, if you ever, ever, ever do this again, we are finished forever. And I was done right there. My wife now, Todd, <clears throat> mm -hmm. is the only person that has ever in my life asked me if I had homework. <laughs> Accountability. Accountability. Um, and uh, her dad, we didn't have nothing, brother. Even though my dad had bought that house, we we didn't have nothing. I mean, my stepmother, I didn't go, I didn't go school shopping for clothes for school. I come home and there were clothes laying on my bed and if they fit, they fit. And I, that's what I wore. That's I didn't it. know any better. I, I didn't have the best shoes that everybody else had going around, but I didn't sort of like my dad saying back in the day, whenever he was a kid coming up, <clears throat> he said, we were poor, but we didn't know it. He said, everybody was poor. So, there you, go. you know, and I think maybe that's why I got along so well with the people there on Foster Hollow, you know, the holler that, that is because Tony and them, their, their mom, they didn't, they didn't have back then $40, $50 Nike shoes or Puma shoes and wearing Ralph Lauren or Izod shirts and stuff. If I had any of that stuff, it was because my mom bought it and gave it to me for Christmas or something or for my birthday. Not because my dad didn't buy it, but but I didn't I didn't care. Evie didn't care, but her dad, her dad, her dad, her dad ridiculed me quite a bit. And uh uh I and and I've talked to him about it since then. And uh and he didn't remember it, but now Evie's brother did, and she he told him he said, Oh yeah, dad. He used to call me John Godby, because John Godby was a he actually lived next door to us on airport road whenever we lived there. Um, and, uh, he wore overalls and, you know, the way he dressed people, you know, I guess Irvin just didn't think he was dressed right or whatever. But anyway, yeah. I, so I took that heat and, uh, <clears throat> and through this whole time, man, I just keep feeling a tug. Through, through all this, through through everything that I've told you guys so far, there's always been a tug. I've always, I've always hoping John Goff took me to church, took me to Bible, took took me on on church retreats, um, whenever I was whenever I was little, and there was just it's just like God kept putting people in my life to to protect me and and. Uh, to take care of me. And, and when I look back on it, I mean, I, I, he, he's, he had to, some of the things that's happened to me along the way and things that, you know, 
it, it's it's had he he had to have Todd. I mean, that's that's all. It, it's it had to be the hand of God. So Absolutely. it was probably a year, year and a half after Ev and I got married or got started dating in high school. Um, actually, it was her junior year, my senior year, going into my senior year. Uh, I got Ev pregnant in high school. And uh, it's okay. Long story short, um, wasn't her choice choice, but she had she had an abortion. Yep, which and, was common, uh, which was common to the era. Yep. Uh, it's still common today. So, um, so there, you know, I've all even before then, I've always felt like the black sheep of the family, and after that, definitely, right. And um, and I kind of I kind of tease around a little bit with it, but. But Eva agrees, you know. I've, we've heard she and I've talked to all. Oh, I will always be the black sheep of the family. There's nothing anybody ever do be ever take that title away from me. I mean, that's just I got you know, I got their daughter pregnant, and um, but anyway, uh, my dad, my dad asked, said, let her have it, and he said, we'll adopt it, we'll raise it, and wasn't having none of it. So, anyway wasn't her choice, but, uh, so that happened. And lo and behold, her mom and dad eventually, her mom and dad eventually talked her into breaking up with me. And, and, uh, she was dating another guy that from a, from another County that they had met through dancing and stuff whenever their kids through 4-H. And through this whole time, man, my heart's breaking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I had, uh, well, I had, you know, I wasn't going to play football. Um, I wasn't going to play yep. football my senior year because I was going to go get a job and, you know, help pay and raise the baby. You know, that's, that's right. I mean, I was, I was working and, and doing everything I could. And um, so I ended up playing football that year. And uh, and I joined the military because I thought Ev and I were going to get married. And that was the only way I could go. Whenever I graduated in 1982, you had three choices. You either went south, you went to college, or you went in the military. You, you didn't stay in West Virginia. There was nothing there. Coal mining industry was gone. I come yep. out of high school certified in hydraulics and welding. Nothing there. No job. No nothing. So, so I joined the military and about three months before it was time for me to go in was whenever she broke up with me and said that she didn't want to get married anymore. And, uh, <clears throat> and man, I was, I was, I was hurting. I mean, I was, I was, I was a broken, broken dude. I was drinking, I was smoking dope, uh, It's a thousand wonders. I, I even made it to September to go to boot camp. So my senior year, <clears throat> my dad came home and uh, my baseball coach had ruined me. Ted Murray had ruined me. Um, He had, he had taken something that I loved and just, he was just, I don't know. It wasn't good. I firmly believe that if E.D. Hill would have, would have came into call or come into high school to be the high school coach, whenever coach Carney left, um, that I, 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 you know, maybe baseball would have been an option for college or after, after school. But anyway, 
dad came home one day because I, I was a halfway decent football player. Um, I didn't have letters coming from everybody. If I did, I never did see him because I just didn't have the grades. Right. Uh, I didn't have any more F's on my report card, but I wasn't taking any college prep classes. It was all just your general classes, yep. regular math classes, regular English classes, science classes, social studies. It wasn't anything that to get me ready for college. Right. Right. And dad general came home one day because the coal company that my dad worked for was the, they, they were the largest money donators. They, they, they were the largest donators or, into the athletic program at WVU at the time. And uh, dad came home and he said, John, if Rick and, Rick and Bill Abraham is who he worked for, and it was Omar Mining at that time, which it, it's all gone away now. He said, Rick, want me to come home and tell you that if you would go to, w, go to WVU and walk on, they'll pay for everything. You won't want for nothing. You just, you just got to go to school, go walk on, go play football. Mm. And I couldn't do it. Didn't have the grades. Right. I couldn't have got in if I wanted to. So, um, so before I, so before I went into the, you know, signed up for the military, I went to Potomac State College and visited to go up there and and, and play ball and go to school. And when I got up there, the coach said, "You can come, John, but you're, you're, you're going your first year." of college is going to be just taking what you didn't get in high school. It's not really going to count for it. It's all going to be college prep stuff. That's it. So I got super discouraged because I didn't have anybody at that time, uh, you know, really pushing me along. And so the next thing I know, I'm, I'm going into military. Ed breaks up with me. And, and uh, so I'm in San Diego at boot camp, And, uh, I'm writing Ev letters every, every time I get a chance. I'm writing her letters and nothing back, getting nothing back, getting nothing back, getting nothing back. And, uh, and we're still broke up. We, we haven't, we're, you know, we, we're, 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 we never did, you know, make up or anything. I mean, we're still broke up this time. And, uh, so I get out of boot camp and I go to my, I go to my tech school. And while I'm there, I'm able to call. So finally, I was able to call her and get her on the phone, and we're talking, and I asked her if she'd pick me up at the airport and stuff when I came in on leave, and I did. Well, long story short, I came in. We made up, got back together, or I thought we did. And uh, and I left there and went. So I left when I, when I left there from leave, we had made plans to get married in June when she graduated right. of, uh, of 83. She graduated in May. We'd get married in June. So I left and I, so I left Jaeger airport in Charleston, flew to, flew to LAX in Los Angeles and 36 hours later, I make it to Subic Bay, Philippines. Uh, spent 14 hours at LAX laying on the floor waiting for a flight to leave. And um, so go do my Westpac, talking to Ed, writing letters and everything, everything, you know, it's hunky-dory. So I get back to the States. Actually, I, I actually called her from the Philippines. And it cost me 80 bucks for 20 minutes. And that was back in 1983. And um, so anyway, I got back to the States, pulled in, nobody, you know, everybody else got all their families on the pier, you know, welcome right back. So I go and, and um, I got my first tattoo, or no, I got my second tattoo, got her name on my arm and went and got us an apartment, right? So I tried to call and she wasn't there, but her mom answered and said, uh, John, she's decided she don't want to get married. Dude. So but, I had a plane ticket already uh, bought for right. June because I had, we got back from that Westpac in April, May. 
the end of April, beginning of May. And when I when this all happened, it was two weeks before we were supposed to get married. And uh, so I went back to the apartment and was only able to get three hundred dollars of my six hundred dollars back. So I went back to the ship and had the duty driver. I said, I said, I need you to take me to uh I need you to take me to the airport in San Francisco. And uh so so he took me to the airport and I said, if anybody asks, you haven't seen me. Now this is on Friday, Friday evening. I get this was back in the day where you could walk up to a ticket counter and you could buy a ticket. Oh, and, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. So to the train ticket week to go get married and added and took my $300 that I had and added to that because it was a last minute ticket and it was a one way ticket, not a two way, not round trip. I wasn't coming back. I was getting ready to be AWOL. And uh, so lo and behold, my mom and so dad and Donna weren't even home that weekend. They were gone somewhere. And I knew, I knew that the window in the bathroom didn't lock. Okay. And I, cause I didn't have a key to the house and my car was there. So when I got there, Ev didn't pick, Ev didn't pick, see, Ev picked me up at the airport. I remember Ev picked me up at the airport, took me to the house and I raised the window. The neighbors saw saw me and was getting they thought somebody's breaking in the house but anyway and i got my car and went long story short <clears throat> it woke me up that sunday morning now listen it's friday that i got there spent saturday sunday she wakes me up and she says john if i told you i'd marry you would you go back and i'm thinking and i said no because you're just telling me that to get me to go back. And then you, right, she right. said no. And Todd, what 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 made me say I'll go? I'll go back. I have no idea. But check this out. So they go to her dad's wallet. Her and her mom go to her dad's wallet. Now he's an insurance agent. This time he's they're they're kicking it. They they got money now. Got enough cash out of his wallet to get me a plane ticket back to uh, San Diego back. Well, San Francisco, we're up in San, up in the Bay area. Then. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, we're, we're in Vallejo getting ready for the yards, <clears throat> which is North of Alameda. And it's North of where the, the BART, the Bay area rapid transit stops. It, okay. it, you only got so you didn't get all the way up to Vallejo then. I don't know if it goes up there now or not. So I said, yeah, I'll go back. Well, they gave me the money. They took me to the airport. Got We got a ticket. I got on an airplane and then went back. When I got, when I got to the airport in San Francisco, I got in a cab. And I said, I've got this much money. I think it was like $25, $30. I said, you start your meter. And when you get the $30, you stop. Because that's all the money I got. I don't have a penny more. Right, right. Todd, when his when his meter hit $30, I was at the gate of Vallejo Naval Naval Station. Ah, you can't make it up. You I'm telling but you, God. you can't but God. So, and I can't remember how I got the money to get the ticket to go back. Um Maybe I didn't trade that ticket in. Maybe I used the other money. But anyway, I went and no, listen, nobody, this is Sunday. Nobody and her grandmother knew that I was in West Virginia on the East Coast for the last two or three days. And I'm back and I get up and go to quarters on Monday. On Friday, I get on an airplane, go back, and we get married. And the rest is history. There you go. But God. But, but God. God. So. <clears throat> So anyway, it's not all, it's all, it's not all roses from there. You doing okay? You need to take a break or anything? Or no, you we're good? good to go. 
they were 25 minutes in on this one. So I'm trying to think of where I want to go. Make sure I don't skip anything. So we get married. <clears throat> now listen, you can't make this stuff up, bro. So when I went in the military, um, Dad and Donna had given me a 1976 Grand Prix. It was a tank, brother. I mean, all it needed was a turret. You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> I love that car, though, man. Hey, listen, it was like a queen size bed in the front and back seat. But anyway, you can you don't, you don't get nothing like that today. So anyway, um, when I came home on leave, when I got out of the when I got out of boot camp, I traded it for a little two-seater Fiat. Okay. So when I come back to get married, we're getting ready to go across country in a Fiat. Fiat. Pulling a U-Haul. Wow. So her wow. dad said, no, 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 no. This, <laughs> this can't happen. So we sold, we sold the Fiat to somebody outright. Her dad went and found a 1990... Or not? No, it was a 19, 1984, not, not, 1980, 82 Grand Prix. I've got a picture of it, and uh, it was a it was a two door, and that's what that's what we we put a hitch on it. Yeah, we used that car to pull our U-Haul across country. So here, Abby and I are. We don't have a pot to pee in, brother. Listen, the only money we got is what we got at our wedding. We told people, don't buy us nothing. We need money. And I think we got right at $2,000. Okay. In a car pulling a U-Haul that gets probably 10 to 12 miles a gallon. Okay. So we're headed across country, man. We're living up. We stop in Nashville and see my aunt, even Uncle Tom, and, and spend some time with them. And and we stop at the Grand Canyon and and uh, for a little bit. And we don't spend night or anything. We just stop by and take a look. And then we go on up. But when we get there, um, we don't have a place to stay. So I was able to go to temporary housing, and they gave us they gave us an apartment there. All right. And um, we still had a, we still had a little bit of money, like a few hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars maybe. Well, I had just gotten paid. Mm -hmm. And we were getting ready to go back out for a little bit on the ship for a week to go to Monterey, California. Well, while we were out there, I got my wallet stolen with all my money in it. And so when I got back, I, had to, I told Ev, I said, we, uh, our rent money, everything's gone. So we went back to temporary housing and brother, they loaned us $240. We never, we didn't, they, they gave it to us. We had to pay it back. Hmm. And so we were there, we were there for a couple of months and then we were going, then we were leaving Vallejo after we got everything tore off the ship and everything. Like that. Then we were going to San Diego to 32nd street Naval base. It's the pier there, a pier one for the yards. So we lived in San Diego in Chula Vista on F street for about a year. And uh, when we moved down there, bro, they put, we put everything we had in our car, everything we owned went inside that car. We drove that car. Actually, I think I drove the car and somebody brought Evie behind me to the ship and they picked that car up and put it up on the ship. And Evie rode with me to San Diego. We fast cruised to San Diego. And, uh, <laughs> Then we found a little apartment down there. Well, we got pregnant. For yep. sure, Ev got pregnant down there. Yep. Yep. And um, at that time, when she was pregnant, my cousin, David Chapman, who was in the Navy, he was a Navy SEAL, he was coming back to the West Coast from the East Coast to be a BUDS instructor. And his wife was pregnant. Ray Ann was pregnant with Jacob. So anyway, 
Uh, we're excited about the pregnancy and everything. I mean, we're just we're just super, super just. And uh, Ev's mom comes out for the birth, and Ev goes into labor, and we're there. In you know, I'm there with Ev. Ev's mom's there. Danielle's born, and as soon as she's born, they rush her off to neonatal. Yep. I see you. And uh, Ev and I are just stunned. We're we're no we're, idea. You know, right. We're you know we're in shock. Yeah. And uh, so they got her. They got her stable. And. Uh, came and talked to us and they, they said, we don't know what's going on right now, but I mean, she was as blue as the blue around us right now in that background. Right. right. Yep. And, um, long story short, they did, they, they grew her chromosomes and realized that she had what was called trisomy 22, 16 Q which meant part of her 16th chromosome had broke off and attached it to the 22nd. And uh, so when they figured that out, they they sent Ev and I to Miramar Naval Air Station where Top Gun was filmed. And uh, yep. so anytime I watch Top Gun, man, my heart just kind of sinks because it oh, always takes me back yep. to when we went there. That's it. So we they grew our chromosomes and come to find out it was Ev is a carrier, but she's not the one, but but she's not affected by it. And um the it can only come from a male or from the female. It can't come from the male, so it doesn't I wish we still had all the paperwork because there's been some confusion about all that, but I'll never forget this. <laughs> And it's nothing against ever females or anything. It's just something that's genetically passed down through females that the boys can't pass it along. And uh, I mean, I've got two beautiful granddaughters right now, and they're they're sharp as a tack, and there ain't nothing wrong with them two. Oh, and they're a little ornery. Uh, I can't so, imagine where they got that from, John. Yeah, they're uh, they're grandmas. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> At that time, there was only six known cases in the United States of what Danielle had. She was born at Balboa, Balboa Naval Hospital in San Diego that year. So, <clears throat> and normally babies who have that, have that, you know, that defect, they're either stillborn or they don't live, but just a day or two after birth. I mean, they don't live very long. And, and Danielle, here Danielle's still with us. So in the military, you have what's called a humanitarian transfer, but it takes forever to get one of those approved. And in the Navy, I don't know if it's still this way or not. I know back when I was in, we had what we call detailers, that when it comes time for us to change uh, duty stations, we would pick up the phone, call the Pentagon, talk to our detailer and negotiate a duty station when we get went ready to, when we got ready to re up, um, uh, to reenlist. And that's how that worked. And that they're all, your detailer is also the ones that your humanitarian transfer requests go through. And you've got to have letters from your CO, your XO, uh, your department head, uh, the the command master chief. You've got to have your hometown pastor. You've got to have the navy chaplain of the base that you're on. You've got to have I forget how many different letters from doctors. It was just a, the the stack of paperwork like this. It, it's amazing. Oh yeah. So I I was able to pull all that together, and the CEO pulled me pulled me into his office on the Shasta. I was on board the U.S. and that, that it's no longer here. It's been chopped up into razor blades. And he said, John, he said, if you'll stay here, you can take, you can go to Balboa Naval Station and uh, Naval Hospital, or there's, there was another one up around San Francisco, a little bit north of San Diego that was supposed to be a really good Naval Hospital. He said, I'll give you all the time you need. And I said, I said, Captain, you don't understand. 
all our family is in West Virginia. All our support is in West Virginia. That's that's where I need to go. So, and I don't know how many times he had talked to me about it. So I finally got all my paperwork together. We're about a month. We're about four to five weeks into this, and I've already got all my paperwork together. Now, listen, folks, you got to understand something, too. In 1983, we, you don't have a cell phone. Nope. You don't have email. Nope. You have a have phone fax. booth. You don't even have a fax. No, and you have a phone booth. The closest thing you have to a fax on a ship is a radio transmission, and that's how we got all our radio. That, that's basically <laughs> what it was. So, um, so I called. So I submitted my paperwork, called my detailer, a wonderful lady, and if you're ever listening to this, whoever you are, if you're still with us today and you hear this. Please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you. I would love to have you on this podcast. Um, and they'll know who it is because you're going, you, she'll know who I am because you're you're not going to believe how all this plays out. So I call. Um, you got to remember, I'm not, I'm not living my life for the Lord. My wife and I both went to church as kids. My wife gave her life to the Lord when she was younger, you know, earlier on in teenage years. Um, and, and so we're going to church and, and Christian people, you know, we're, we're not doing that right now. Now we're not drugging and smoking and coking and drinking. We didn't have money for that either. As a matter of fact, we would go to the grocery store once every two weeks, sometimes once a month. And there've been several times, Todd, that I had to take her on board the ship to eat. Yep because we didn't have anything at the house to eat and they would let me bring her on board and she would eat dinner with me on board right. the ship. Yep. And um, we would make pancakes out of water and Bisquick. And that's, that's what we had. But you know what, man, we loved it. We wouldn't trade them days for nothing now, nothing. man. Nothing. That's who, man, that's who, yep. that's what made our relationship. So back to the detailer. So I called her and I said, look, my paperwork's coming. Do you know about how long it takes? to get approved. She said, John, <clears throat> I can't remember if she called me John or Petty Officer Garrett at the time, but anyway, I'll say John. She said, John, um, this, this can take four to six months uh, from the time that I receive it. I, I just, she said, I can't, I can't tell you. So I turned it in <clears throat> and it's about, Two and a half weeks later, on board the ship, each department, we have different spaces on there that we have to take care of. Yep. And I had a machinery room because I was in race division, and that's not like it was replenishment at sea equipment division, okay? It wasn't a race like everybody thinks of today. When you think of skin color or ethnic. And and I had a I had a machinery room that I had painted the floors and painted the the the, the winch and everything in there and had it all cleaned up and I was getting ready to present my space. And when the captain comes around, your 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 petty officer in charge or your POIC or whoever it is that's over your divisions were there. The captain's there and he has a yeoman who's recording everything for him whenever he's there. That's right. So he's not writing it down. He's dictating and somebody else is writing it down. That's right. So. He walks up, I present him my space, and I said, uh, uh, good morning, Captain, Petty Officer Garrett, standing by for inspection. You never said ready. You ever said ready, brother? They're going to tear your pants off of you. You always said standing by. <laughs> and he, he rendered a salute back. And he said, uh, so let me back up. So when I got to quarters, I, so when I got to the ship that morning, uh, PN1 personnelman first class came to me and said, your orders came through this morning. And I said, what? I got to. Ha. Yeah. Hit that pause. He said, uh, your orders came through. Hey, John, hit that pause right now. Yeah. Thanks Todd. I needed that man. Um, that's never hit me like that before telling this story. Well, um, 
I do want to back up and clarify something before I continue the story. Um, though Ev and I had that situation when we were in high school with her mom and dad and, and what went on with, with the abortion, her mom and dad are the ones that made it possible for us to have a car. That's right. They paid the insurance uh, and they paid, you know, they, they made, they paid pretty much paid for the car. Um, we didn't have a pot to pee into. Uh, I was an E1 when we got married. Um, I think I got paid $333 a month or I mean $333 a paycheck. So our rent was $400, a little over $400. So we had less than two hundred dollars to buy gas and food, and now, granted, we could go to the commissary back then with thirty dollars and fill up a, you know, a, a grocery cart pretty good. Oh yeah, and yeah. So, but anyway, I, I did want to give a shout out to Urban and Glenda and uh, my appreciation for them for what they did, and because of what they've done, we've been able to pay for that forward. We, we were able to do that for Richie and Michelle. Yep. When they first got married, after they'd got married and came back to the States, we did that with them. And we've also done that with Chad and Jail. So it's, it, it's something that we were able to pay forward. Um, yes. So, so I go to quarters that morning. Um, and I, I, before I do that, I do want to back up a little bit further. So while during the period, it's funny how things come back to you as you're as you're as you're talking that you missed. So we did things. So during that waiting period for my orders to be approved to come back from orders to come back from the detailer, we would do what would call we would call a fast cruise. And that's just where you everything you pull the you pull the the uh the brow up from the pier and you're still moored to the, to the, to the pier, but there's no brow. The brows pull it up. You can't get on and off the ship and it's, everything happens just like you're underway. It's a okay. practice run for as if you're underway, your, your yep. watches, everything, yep. all the rotation, everything you do is just like you're, you're at sea. You're at sea. Yes. But you still have a quarter deck watch because they have to have somebody there to see if some, you know, what's going on. Well, Somebody grabbed a hold of me and said, Hey, your wife's on the pier. And um, when I walk over there, man, she is boohooing and crying. I mean, she is just, she's distraught. And Danielle had been put back in the hospital. Um, now, because now, let me tell everybody now, she didn't, once they figured out what was wrong with her, um, I wish I had a picture to put on here. Um, I might try to find one between our next one, Todd. Um, but anyway, there's, um, they raised, they, they raised, they took me off of that ship and put me on the pier in a bucket with a crane that day. Yep. Um, I, I had the greatest support. Uh, from the leadership on board the Shasta and the, the command master chief, my even chiefs, senior chiefs that weren't even in my division. Um, they were, they were deck division like I was, but it, they were in different departments. Right. Um, and um, super people. So back to my story. So I'm getting up to go to quarters after I talked to PM one and, and senior chief came up to me and he said, John, he said, your orders are here. He said, yeah, I talked to PM one. Um, and uh, so when PN1 originally told me earlier that morning that my orders are there, I said, how soon will I be able to get out of here? And he said, he said, it's going to take me a week or two to process your orders. I said, cool. I said, well, I said, what all do I take? He said, you take everything, dude. You ain't coming back here. <laughs> you, you won't come back here. You'll get new orders from wherever you leave from uh, on the East Coast. You won't be coming back here. So you need to go start packing now. So I went down, started packing everything up. And so in the meantime, I had to go back and present my, through all this is going on, I have to go back and present my space to the captain. That's right. <clears throat> so like I said, I presented my space, standing by for inspection. He said, Petty Officer Garrett, your orders came in. 
did you know your orders came in? I said, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir, Captain. I know PN1 told me that they're here. He said, you're leaving today, right? I said, no, sir. He said, Petty Officer Garrett, you're leaving today, right? I said, uh, no, sir, Captain. PN1 told me it's going to take it's going to take him a couple of weeks to, to get me off the boat. He looked at that yeoman and he said, you go right now until PN1. He's got 30 minutes to have this man walking down the brow. And I was gone. Move. <laughs> um, so go to Cal. So, so Evan, at this point now, Evan, Evan, the baby, Evan, Danielle are already in West Virginia. So um, I have the U-Haul packed um, and uh, ready to go. So I jump in the car and I head across country. And here's, here's another God thing, Todd. So I'm in such a hurry to get back home. Right. So I left San Diego, headed across country on 20. He's down and down. At six o'clock in the evening. And a little over 24 hours later, a car blows their horn at me and wakes me up as I'm going off an off ramp. So I pulled over, slept a little bit, got back on the road, and I did a three day trip in two days. Yep. So fast forward, um, I go to the reserve center at in Charleston, West Virginia. Wonderful people there, man. I mean, it was just, it was a great place. Danielle, um, Danielle's putting on a little bit of weight and, um, she has a cardiologist at WVU medical center in Morgantown. And she has a pediatrician there, um, there in Charleston. And, and, you know, days go by and days go by. Well, next thing we know, we had been there. We hadn't been there for about two and a half, three months. Danielle goes into congestive heart failure. And Evie's uncle Rick, he's passed now. He's he he passed away due to COVID related stuff. Um, he was a paramedic. And um he came and picked Danielle up. They took Danielle to the hospital in Charleston in the ambulance. Now, I'm following behind them, right, in Charleston. And when they, get to, when they get to the emergency room, her pediatrician meets them there and says, we've got to get this girl to WVU immediately. Dude, they called the governor, and they flew her to Morgantown on the governor's airplane. Didn't have helos back then. Didn't have nope. life net, health net. Nope. So I get on the road, they're flying up there. I'm on the road driving between Charleston and Morgantown. It's late night, I put my hazards on and, and I just pray God, please keep, the, please keep the deer out of the way. And back then there was traffic on the... So... When Dr. Gustafsson examined her, he said, we've got a decision to make. Because we knew we were facing open heart surgery. We just didn't right. know, do we do the surgery or do we just let her live out her life, what she has left? And, and how do we know what's right? Well, we had come to the point to where either she was going to die or we had to do surgery. There was no, there was no other option at this point. So we elected to have surgery. <laughs> So she went into open heart surgery and for 36, so 36 hours after that, she actually passed away. But there's some story in between that time. Dr. Gustafsson never, he never left. He's actually had medical centers named after him now. He, man is, he's prestigious in what he, in his field. 
he was the he Danielle was his first loss. He had never lost a baby until Danielle. He was tore up, dude. 36 hours, that man never left her side. While she was in recovery, one of the one of the preachers from the church, he wasn't my pastor because he didn't, he wasn't the pastor there whenever Ev and I went to church there in West Madison. I don't even know why he came up there. I don't know if Irvin and Glenda asked him to come up there. I, I don't, I can't remember why he was there. And remember, I told you, Evan and I aren't living our lives for the Lord at this time. And this is a warning going out to people. When you try to help somebody that's suffering through a loss or a time of hurt and need, be very careful what you say. Absolutely. Be be very careful. I what know you where say. this is going, and I know this. We we've talked about this, so I. Yeah. So here Ev and I are, 18 and 19 years old, with a five-month-old little girl in recovery in ICU after surgery. Hmm. And I look at that pastor and I said, because of the life that Ev and I are living, where we're not living a Christian life, what's going to happen to her if she dies? Without hesitation, with no grace, no compassion, looked me dead in the eye and said, if she dies, she's going to go straight to hell because of the way you're living. I lived with that for years, Tom. Uh huh. Danielle passed 36 hours after surgery, and they came to us and said, uh, Would you approve us to do an autopsy? And at that time, Ev and I were just distraught. And when we went in to see her, Todd, I'll never forget. She was so swollen. Mm -hmm. She didn't look like our little girl. Evie used to call her mommy's little ballerina. It's on her tombstone because yep. Danielle's toes always pointed down. Right. And she was never able to support herself at any time, even at five months. She she was never able to sit up on her own. Um, I think she got up to almost 10 pounds. Um, but when Evan would hold her up, it's just a little nightgown she'd have on her most of the time, or sleeper, her toes would be pointed down. So Evan always called her mommy's little ballerina. That's right. <laughs> Um, so they did the autopsy. We, Evan and I first said no, and then we changed our mind and we said, you know what? She's not in there anyway. And if, if her, if her death will help the next child, yeah, go ahead and do it. But when we got the autopsy report back at the very top of the, I wish I still had that. We've lost that report somewhere through the years. Danielle would be 40. She'd be almost 40 years old, 38. She'd be 39, 40 years old. But at the very top, it said, before it went into everything that was wrong, it said the, the issues that she had could have never been corrected. Right. And that they had no idea how she lived five months. So the healing that took place between our families while she was alive was amazing. I don't think she ever suffered. I mean, it, it used to kill me, man, seeing all the needles and the bruises and the, the poking oh, yeah. and the prodding yeah. that went on, man. 
But she had she had an enlarged heart. She had a hole between the top two ventricles and the bottom two ventricles of her heart. One of the veins or the ventricles, or whatever that comes in, came into the heart in the wrong place. Um, her lungs were suppressed and had never expanded because of the enlarged heart and the other areas that she had, things she had. And uh, I, I, I know why she lived as long as she did. I mean, it's just, it's God, man. That's right. So when, it, when she he, passed, go ahead, Todd. There was things he had working in place moving forward that he used he used that baby girl to get in get in line i hate to break it here with everybody but todd i think this would be a good place maybe we'll encourage people to come back and, and pick up from here we're at 56 minutes and absolutely uh, yes yes i'll uh but there's much much more to what god what God's done through all this. Um, That's right. So tune in next week and we'll, we'll pick up from when Evan and I left and went to, went to Scotland. In the meantime, guys go to uh 11 armory.com. Check out the merchandise. Um, all that's all the proceeds off the merchandise sold goes to support one kingdom. If you felt led to, check out onekingdom.org and uh, maybe support the both of them. One Kingdom is known for putting the gospel out in every nation and every language. Their ministry arm supports cult ministries, re relief ministries all over the world. The most recent is the hurricane relief going on in North Carolina. Just uh, check it out. Support support six eleven Armory. And uh, go check out Chad's site. Um, where did I, there we go. So go check out Chad at uh, forerunnerproductions.locals.com, forerunnerproductions.com. Chad's into a bunch of short films and stuff now, and he's got um, – stuff on there that he's done and others have done that he's releasing now doing really well. And, um, but yeah, there, there you can find it. <clears throat> you can find us on YouTube at forerunner productions, go to playlists and select let's talk fortitude. And there's other stuff on there that you may want to check out as well, or you can check us out on any of your audio podcast platforms, anywhere you get your podcast from. That's right. Also, I think this is still available. Chad's book, You're Not Special, You're Gifted. It's a great book. Go on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. Go on there and check it out. Um, he wrote that a few years back. And uh, I've read it personally, and I thought it was really, really good. Uh, he's wanting to do a revised version of it. And uh, But anyway, like and subscribe. Share this video with people you like. And uh, when we come back, we'll pick back up in where we were and uh, getting ready to head to Scotland. And boy, is, uh, is my world getting ready to get turned upside down again. Anyway, we love you guys.